Hello, everybody, and welcome to our TIFF Talk. I am super excited uh, today because we have two special guests. We have Dr. Joan Keeter from uh, Maine General, and as well as Dr. Keeter, we have one of his patients, and ironically, her name is Tiffany Gray, and Tiffany had the TIFF procedure. So uh, before we start, I do want to remind everybody, um, this is a live uh, event, and at any time, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the comment section, and we will do our best to answer all of your questions. So thank you again for joining us this evening. Um, I'm going to give you a quick uh, introduction to our special guests. Also, if you don't mind typing in where you're tuning in from, that would be fantastic. We'd love to see uh, where, we, where everyone is from. Uh, so, Dr. Joan Keeter uh, received his medical degree from University of Aleppo Faculty of Medicine in Syria, and his internal medicine residency was completed at the University of Massachusetts school, uh, Medical School. Dr. Kim, uh, Keeter then completed fellowships in gastroenterology and advanced therapeutic endoscopy, also at the University of Massachusetts medical school. He holds memberships in the Syrian American Medical Society, the American Gastrointestinal Association, the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and the American College of Gastroenterology. Dr. Keeter is board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology, and his special interests include digestive and pancreatic intervention. So um, we'd like to welcome Dr. Keeter uh, to our show, as well as uh, Tiffany Gray. Uh, Tiffany, welcome Tiffany. Uh, she is the lead uh, endoscopy tech at Maine General's endoscopy yeah. unit and Dr. Keeter's patient. Uh, she had the TIF procedure performed about six months ago in February of 2022. So not only is Tiffany Dr. Keeter's patient, she's actually the nurse that uh, helps and assists Dr. Keeter uh, during all of the TIF procedures that they do at the hospital. So welcome Tiffany and thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to go ahead and Dr. Keeter, thank you so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Do we still have you on online? I don't see him. So, see him. well, we're going to hopefully wait for him to jump back on. And until then, let's get some, maybe we can get through some questions um, with Wendy from our viewers. Viewers. Oh, there's Dr. Keeter. How are you, Dr. Keeter? You're back. I'm doing good. You got to love live events, right? IT exactly. problem always happen in live events. Uh, we're we're <laughs> always ready for it. We're always ready for it. So I, I was giving your introduction, and I also wanted to welcome you and thank you thank for you. being here tonight. So, well, before we go to questions, now that we got Dr. Keeter back, we're going to go ahead and start the program. Sure. Dr. Keeter, the first thing we usually have uh, the physicians do is kind of explain what is GERD and potentially what could patients be feeling if they were suffering from GERD. Okay, so thank you first for having me on to help educate the uh, folks on Facebook and the community about this problem. GERD is a very common problem, actually. 44% of the population in the U.S. will experience GERD at least once a month, and 20% will experience it more than once in a week. So it's a very common. It's basically when the content of the stomach kind of back up or reflux into the esophagus. Now, I just want to clarify, like, mo some reflux can be what we call physiological, meaning happening even in normal people who does not have the disease. But when it's become symptomatic, meaning when people have the heartburn, the bloating, the food coming up to their throat, this is what we call the typical symptoms. Uh, that's basically what define as gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, people could also have what we call atypical symptoms. So this is, can be hoarseness, uh, hoarseness in the voice, uh, changing, especially they, sometimes they go see a throat doctor and they do examination and they tell them the throat is basically inflamed from the acid that backing up. Uh, sometimes even people will have asthma or asthma flare up before because of the acid 
coming up to their throat. So it's a wide variety of symptoms that it can experience uh, over sometimes a long period of time. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And Tiffany, when did you first start having your symptoms um, and kind of what symptoms did you experience? Did you experience the typical symptoms or more of the atypical symptoms? Yes, my reflux started after my second pregnancy. Actually, I think the pregnancy triggered it. And after that, it got a little bit better, but it was off and on where I needed to take Tums. Um, after that, it just got worse, you know, so it's progressively gotten worse. Um, it was the normal at first, the, the acid, the burning of, you know, the acid. Um, and then I experienced a dry mm -hmm. cough. I could not stop coughing. And I was like, oh, you know, it's allergies, this and that. I, I thought, and then finally it went on for about two weeks where I just could not stop coughing. Went to the doctor and he told me that I had acid okay. reflux. <laughs> I had never heard of a cough as a symptom of acid reflux. He then put me on some PPI, Nexium, and within days that cough went away and I felt wow. better. Wow, so did you see Dr. Keeter at that time or did you see your uh, PCP or your general practitioner? I lived in a okay. different state and I saw my PCP okay. Okay. for that. Fantastic. Yeah. And he was the one that diagnosed All right. me. I'm going to get that whole full story when you finally met Dr. <laughs> Keeter and when the tips started coming into the picture. Um, thank you for letting us know about that. Dr. Keeter, tell us a little bit about what you tell your patients to do if they're just kind of initially needing to manage their GERD symptoms. So, yeah, so uh, GERD management basically is three components. The first one we called it lifestyle modification which most of the people find it a little bit difficult. I don't blame them because it does include avoiding some of the stuff that patient actually prefer, including like spicy food, greasy food, coffee, chocolate, alcohol, all these stuff make the stomach produce more acids. And obviously more acids in the stomach, it's gonna cause them more symptoms. Um, also, we tell them, left the head bed a little bit up, uh, like a 30 degree, because when they sleep, if the esophagus and the stomach, it's in the same level, basically, they're going to experience those symptoms. Weight loss, uh, as well as avoiding kind of wearing any tight clothes or anything can increase the pressure in the belly. So those are combination of stuff that can do, we call them lifestyle changes. The other component is the medication. Now, uh, Maalox or uh, Rolaid, those over-the-counter stuff that can be used as needed. We can also, some of the other medication like H2 blocker, like Pepsid, the common one over-the-counter. Then we go to the class of what we call the PPI, of the proton pump inhibitor. Common ones like Nexium or Omeprazole. These people can use them to kind of help uh, with their symptoms. Now, I, depending on the severity, how bad is their symptoms, then we can talk about interventions, either endoscopic or surgery to help with their reflux. Thank you for that. And Tiffany, what were there things that you did aside from the medications that you were taking to help you? Did you, like, were you able to sleep at night from your GERD? Did that bother you at all? You know, were there any types of activities that you were unable to do because of your, your GERD? Yes, I noticed um, when bending over, that was a lot. That's when I would feel the acid come up. Um, and sleep. Yeah, I'm no, that's sorry. okay. <laughs> was sleeping difficult for you? I know I'm a I'm suffer it from was, acid reflux. It was, and it yeah. wasn't every night, yeah. um, but I did have frequent nights where I was up and I'd have to sit up in a chair the couch to relieve my symptoms. Right. And I'd always have the Tums nearby. Those Tums, those Tums. <laughs> <Always>. <laughs> Dr. Keeter, what uh, can unmanaged uh, GERD lead to? Is there, if, you know, or untreated GERD, is, are there, you know, certain things that could, could potentially occur if they don't treat, if someone does not treat their GERD symptoms? 
Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And I tell all my patients, it's not only that it's it's bother you when you eat a specific food or do a specific activity. It's the long-term consequences of GERD or acid reflux. That's what we worry about. One of the things can happen is constant inflammation in the esophagus or the food pipe can lead eventually to narrowing, which meaning the food can get stuck. And the more important is what condition called buried esophagus. This is when the lining of the esophagus starts to change to try fight the acid because the esophagus is not equipped to handle the acid. Buried esophagus by itself, it's a benign condition, but it's a precancerous in the same time. So if it's left unmonitored or untreated, eventually, unfortunately, can cause to esophageal cancer. Yeah, thank you for letting us know about that. And uh, were you, so I, I kind of want to get into the story about uh, <laughs> Tiffany. When did you meet Dr. Keeter? Because I know you work at that hospital now and you are his uh, nurse during the TIF procedure. So did you know about the TIF procedure before you met Dr. Keeter? I okay. did not. Uh, to be honest, I worked at Maine General for six years, came over to endoscopy three years ago. That's when I met okay. Dr. Keeter. We started working together. And um, as, you know, he was introducing the TIF procedure, I was very intrigued, wanted to know. I've kind of find my, I've found my niche here in endoscopy. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, so that's how I learned about the TIF and as it was coming on board and we were going to start doing these procedures, I was learn. you know, that's when I was learning. Sure. About you, got the, you got the in-depth yeah. uh, yeah. TIF uh, education, if you will. So did Dr. Keeter know that you had uh, GERD at the time or? Okay. Yes. So my GERD had gotten okay. worse and they increased my dose of omeprazole. My PCP okay. did. And that's when she said, okay, I think you, you, you need to go see GI and get an EGD done. So I did. And ironically, this was about the same time we were introducing wow. the TIFs. Okay. Into our, you know, into sure. the unit. So here I did. I have my EGD and there he tells me, oh, you're a candidate for a TIF procedure. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and, I'm, and I think we had just started, um, I don't know if you can recall Dr. Keeter, but I think we had just maybe had one or two days that we had done the procedures. Okay. 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 After you learned about the TIF procedure, you know, obviously through the education because it was coming into your program and you've done or worked with Dr. Keeter on doing a couple of procedures, what is the one thing that made you decide, you know what, this is what I want to do and this is what I, I'm just going to do it. I, I got my EGD, I'm a candidate, I want I want to do the TIF procedure. What was the decision making factor? Was it because you saw other patients doing well after their procedure? Was it you just like the idea of that versus the alternatives? You didn't want to be on your medications mm -hmm. anymore. Just kind of give us a idea of why. What made you change make make that decision? <laughs> right. Well, I'm going to say the first one is not having to take medication. Um, I was at the point where if I missed a dose, I, I was miserable. Yeah. Um, and then it's minimally invasive. I mean, my recovery time was great. Uh, even the patients prior to me, they were doing very well. Um, they adapted to the diet, and it, it, I would say all of them are off PPI. Fantastic. And that right there is fantastic. Right, right. You see firsthand yeah. how, they're, how they're doing. Correct. <laughs> uh, I am going to pass it over to Wendy. I see a ton of um, people saying, hi, you've got a fan base, Dr. Keeter and <laughs> Tiffany. That is for sure. So thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, and I know uh, there's some questions that have been popping up, so I'm going to let Wendy take it away. Thanks, Andrea. Yes, lots of activity on our feed this evening. Um, big fan base out there for sure. Um, so we do have questions mostly right now regarding the medications. Obviously, we have that one that I'm sure you're asked all the time, which is the best medication to take? Uh, 
there is no one medication is going to fit everybody. I have to say that. It's depending on the symptoms, the severity, what exactly the, the uh, outcome they want to look at. There is not one single pill that can fix everything. Uh, some people, if their GERD are very mild and happen once in a while, they can take some Pepsid. Other people, they need a long-term uh, PPI. Uh, you know, it's, it's all case-by-case -case situation. So there is no one fit everybody. And I, with my situation, I took three different, over the course, three different medications that had to be increased over time. Okay, so in a nutshell, how, how long were you suffering with this? And how long were you taking your meds? Uh, ten Greater than 10 years. Goodness. So you were tired of just being tired? Yes. Yes. And just, and I, it was only getting worse. They, you know, the medications were, were not working. Um, and that's when I had to, I had to do something. Wow. wow. So another question that, that folks are asking is um, about, you know, hiatal hernia. Um, we're talking a little bit about the procedure itself. Andre, we might circle back on that one. I think, um, I think, I'm going to ask Haley's question, which is, hi, Dr. Keeter, uh, can I skip trying medication if I'm interested in going ahead and seeing if I'm a candidate for something else? Uh, sure. Now, obviously, every patient, we um, have them undergo the TIF procedure, all the combined, we call it the C-TIF, where we fix the hiatal hernia and in the same setting, we create the valve at the end of the esophagus. That's what basically the TIF procedure is. Uh, Depending on the situation, depending on what's the symptoms, how often it's happening, obviously we do meet with every patient. We take a full history. Uh, patient need to have an endoscopy procedure, uh, EGD. Basically, that's when they put to sleep and the camera go from the mouth, basically where the food goes, uh, check their esophagus, the food pipe, the stomach. And basically, we evaluate the area where the esophagus and the stomach kind of connect. And that's where kind of people uh, have what we call the hiatal hernia. That's where part of the stomach, which is the top part of the stomach, kind of sliding up to the chest a little bit. Now, everybody has different size of hernia. So the hernia can be small or can be large. Now, the TIF procedure by itself can fix hernia up to two centimeter. When the hernia larger than two centimeter, then they're gonna need what we call the combined procedure where uh, as a gastroenterologist and a surgeon, we have Dr. Kumar here at Maine General, we do combined procedure where Dr. Kumar will be fixing the hiatal hernia first robotically, meaning minimum invasive with only kind of four or five small uh, incision in the belly. And then after he finished that part, we walk in in the room while the patient is asleep and then we create the TIF procedure. Uh, now, again, it's all depend on how big her hiatal hernia, how symptomatic she is. So if people don't want to be on medication, obviously it's it's a good option to go through the evaluation and see if she's candidate for it. Thank you. And can you talk a little bit about, we've, we've talked about EGD, can you talk about the other modalities that are involved with your diagnostic testing and what helps you determine whether somebody, or what they're really good candidates for? Obviously, yeah. So some people, if they have a, a direct injury of the esophagus when we do the endoscopic procedure, which is the upper endoscopy, meaning if they have inflammation in their esophagus, if they have Barrett's esophagus, or you know, if they have narrowing at the end of the esophagus, uh, basically that's indicate they have acid reflux. At that, that point, we know that there is evidence of acid reflux. But some people, they will be symptomatic. We will do the upper endoscopy, but there was no evidence of any damage in the esophagus or evidence, direct evidence of reflux. In this situation, we do what we call a pH study. Basically, a pH study involves um, finding out the amount of acid that coming from the esophagus into, uh, from the stomach, sorry, into the esophagus. There is two way of doing that. I'm not sure if, if people know the term uh, pH probe. That's where small, tiny catheter, uh, I call, tell people it's like a noodle, pass through the nose down to the esophagus. Uh, that study for about 24 hours, uh, basically record how much the acid is coming up. There is another study called the Bravo study. This is a, a little bit more uh, comfortable for the patient because they were put to sleep 
and then we're going to put a small tiny recorder uh, attach it at the end of the esophagus and then they will carry a small recording device that basically uh, the information will be transmitted to that device so we know how much acid is coming up that study can be up to four days that's the advantage of the bravo so we can record a longer period of time we know how often the patient will be symptomatic because they will be recording their symptoms on that device and we know if the symptoms correlate with their acid uh, reflux or not so those are the two studies that we can do right now to basically uh, see if they have acid reflux or not excellent thank you so do you want to talk a little bit about your experiences with those tests tiffany um, yes, so as um, assisting Dr. Keeter with the TIFFs, I also assist in the endoscopy, the EGDs, um, placement of the Bravos and Manos. Um, a manometry is what I had, which is what Dr. Keeter was talking about, the noodle, and it goes down into just your nose. Clarify, Not just want to clarify. The manometry is different than the pH probe. Uh, the manometry is basically when we examine how well the esophagus is working. Okay. And that's basically, we do it for every patient who's going to undergo hiatal hernia repair. And Tiffany had the both procedure just to assure they have a good esophageal motility. I forget to mention that part. Good job, Tiffany. You brought it to my mind. So basically, this is uh, done while the patient awake. And uh, I always apologize to the patient. Sorry, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, but, you know, it's it's a, something we need to make sure that we are not doing a procedure that, God forbid, can cause uh, symptoms or, uh, you know, issue that uh, basically they may experience down the road. So that's what we call manometry. They has the patient swallow 10 times. I will let Tiffany talk about what she did during the test. Yes, and um, they, there's a reason why they apologize. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the most comfortable test. Um, and it lasts maybe 20 minutes, and it does. It's it's a probe that goes down through your nose, down into your esophagus, and they do. They have you swallow at different times. They have a monitor that's recording what that probe is seeing. Um, when we do Bravos, uh, and that's where we place the capsule, like Dr. Keeter said, we put the patient to sleep. He goes down in with the camera and we, we place the capsule. Very minimal um, side effects from that. And they just bring the recorder back in, four in about four days. All right. Thank you. Um, so interesting question from Jennifer, and then Andrea, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, Jennifer says you you are talking about evaluation. Can you tell us how far out that referral process is? I already tell my patients they're going to have a significant time to wait for procedures. Can you tell us what the realistic wait time typically is for a new patient? And then also, what can patients ask their PCP um, to order? study-wise to help reduce the wait time? So uh, I completely understand uh, the issue with the wait time. Uh, it's it's across the country, actually. It's not only here. Uh, but uh, what I will say uh, for primary care or the patient is just ask for referral for intervention for reflux. And then when, when our nurses uh, see this referral, they basically they funnel them into a special pen that we can... I cannot give a date or time or promises that patient is going to be seen next day. I mean, just you cannot do that. But I can promise that those referrals get expedited. Now, just to give outline of how the process go in, uh, again, this procedure is an elective procedure. Uh, I'm not going to say it's not an emergency. So some cases, depending on, you know, as a gastroenterologist, if there is an emergency or something needs to be done, those take a priority, uh, but uh, obviously we do have a special um, track for the TIF or anti-reflux as well uh, to be taken care of. Very good, and I, I think this is great to mention because a lot of folks do, when they finally decide, okay, enough is enough, I've had it, I'm ready, 
you know, it does help to really have them educated, which is why I'm so glad we're in this forum. So everybody can be educated really on, on what to expect. You know, what does that look like? Is it something that you're going to get in for next week and start the process? Likely no, because, you know, as in your specialty, especially now, not only with, you know, the, the pandemic that we experienced, the backlog of patients you had there, and also now them, them uh, or the powers that be saying that, you know, colonoscopy, the new age, you know, yeah. minimum be um, 45. So now you've got a, an immediate backlog on those folks too. So I really yeah. appreciate the Did fact you that you're, you're talking about that because I think it lets everybody know that the minute you're ready, you know, just go ahead and start the process, but not until then, obviously, not until you're ready. Yeah, exactly. And as I said, it's it's go through evaluation. It's not like, hey, how are you doing? Let's do the TIF uh, next month. It's, it's a through evaluation that we go through. We want to make sure we pick the right procedure for the right patient. That's very important. You know, a, a lot of people with uh, reflux, I completely understand they suffer this for a long time. TIF procedure, again, I'm biased. I'm an advanced endoscopist. I like to do this endoscopy, TIF procedure, endoscopy, ultrasound, all these fancy kind of high-tech procedures. But if not the right procedure for the patient, I will advise them. Like uh, we do offer a wide variety of anti-reflux intervention. Uh, I will direct them to whatever uh, suited for him or for them or her or whatever kind of get them the best outcome they are looking for. Thank you. All right, Andrea, one more. I'm sorry, one more. Oh, I was going to say it was a perfect segue to to go into the different t options that are available for GERD. Do, yes. do you want to wait on that question? So, or? Well, before we do that, um, let's just really quickly. Um, hi, Dr. Keeter. Can acid reflux cause ulcers in the stomach? So acid reflux is basically that's when the content of the stomach go up to the uh, esophagus. It can cause ulcers in the esophagus. Uh, ulcers in the stomach has multiple reasons. It used to be bacteria called H. pylori in the old days. Uh, now, actually, we see most common uh, cause of ulcers in the stomach. It's using of what we call NSAIDs. This is include uh, Aleve, ibuprofen, Motrin. Uh, those they can cause ulcers in the stomach if used uh, in a especially high doses and frequently. So acid reflux can cause an ulcer, but it's an esophagus in the stomach. That's a different process. It's also related to increased acid in the stomach, obviously, but it's a, it's a different location. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Andrea, back to you. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So uh, I did want to get into, you know, we know obviously the TIF procedure is not the only procedure out there, but maybe you can talk about what are the different options for patients if they are suffering from massive reflux that you offer today. Yeah, absolutely. So we do offer a wide variety of intervention. Obviously, in the old days, used to be take the medication or go have what we call a Nissen fundoplication. The symphondoplication is basically a surgery that they use to basically wrap the stomach around the esophagus. And that's basically old uh, surgery, still a gold standard. It's not a bad surgery or anything like that. Some people will be benefit from it. But over the year, they did find some what we call long-term issue patient having. Some people will say we can't vomit after this procedure. Some people will complain of bloating sensation after the procedure or difficulty swallowing. Other uh, intervention, which I'm pretty sure a lot of people heard about it, called the Lynx procedure. We do offer that here also at Maine General. This is where they put a magnet, ring magnet, around the end of the esophagus. Obviously, that ring magnet is not the same size for everybody but it's also an option for people who are willing to have this procedure done. And obviously we do offer the TIF or the other variety, which is the concomitant or combined hiatal hernia repair, as well as the TIF procedure in the same day setting as well. Perfect, thank you. And Tiffany, I know I asked you this earlier uh, in regards to you know why, what made you choose the TIF procedure, but did you, um, during your process of understanding that I needed to do something, did you get to a point where you uh, researched other options or did you just know I want to do the TIF because it's minimally invasive or whatnot? Yes, I, I didn't try any other options. I stayed on my medication until the procedure. Um, definitely 
being on the TIF team and, and assisting Dr. Keeter with the procedure definitely swayed me that way. Okay. Um, and just seeing, you know, the improvement in, in the previous patients and, and again, how minimally evasive sure. the um, procedure really is. And I did have the C-TIF. I had the hernia repair with the TIF. And even with that, the recovery was great. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Dr. Keeter, can you, let's get into the TIF procedure uh, and tell everybody that's watching, what is the TIF procedure and how does it work? So the TIF procedure, basically TIF stands for transoral incisionless fundoplication. Transoral basically means through the mouth, incisionless without an incision, fundoplication meaning creating that valve at the end of the esophagus. Now, uh, we have a lot of more understanding about what's the connection between the esophagus and the stomach is. It used to be, oh, this is just a muscle there open and closed. But now we have more understanding about the physiology of it. You have a lot of component of it. You have the diaphragm. You have also the muscle at the end of the esophagus. And you also have the angle between the stomach and the esophagus when they connect together. So all these stuff component together create what we call the valve or the flappy valve. Now, the cool things with the tip is after we go through the mouth with the device down to the stomach, we can create the valve from inside. We kind of mimic the valve that people naturally had, had before they kind of lost it, either hiatal hernia or anatomical changes. So that's the cool thing. The procedure itself is not too long. It take about 30, 40 minutes, 35 minutes, sometimes, give or take. Uh, as Tiffany said, uh, recovery, it's, it's pretty well. It's minimum invasive. There is no incision involved in it at all. Fantastic. Thank you. And now let's talk about um, the recovery. I think this is the one thing every patient wants to know about. How How's the recovery? What's this diet I hear that I have to do? Um, so maybe Dr. Keeter first will have you explain you know, what, what can patients expect right after, you know, what's the recovery look like? When can they go back to normal activity? When can they um, potentially, you know, what does your, your recommendation for progression of diet? And then we'll get with uh, Tiffany to see, hear about her experience. Sure. So that's that's actually a good question. We can I go over that uh, repeatedly with the patient when I see them in the office, and even before we kind of get them into operating room to explain to them so they would know what to expect coming up. Because I don't want a patient wake up and I want a hot dog sandwich. That's not going to work. Uh, so because we're creating that valve at the end of the esophagus, there is some recovery time. That valve will be swollen in the first few days, but we keep people on a liquid diet. So basically any kind of liquid diet they can see through, uh, that will be allowed right after when they wake up from anesthesia and they were doing those. So liquid diet for the first few days. And I always tell people, actually, I have a chart. I hope I have a copy yeah. here, but I, maybe you can show it if, if available to you. It's a range of days. Some people will be able to progress within a day or two. Some people will take them a little bit longer. Everybody recovery time is a little bit different because we all recover in different ways. So liquid diet for the first few days, then they will go what we call a full liquid diet. This is where the consistency of the liquid will be a little bit more thicker. So they can get more options like soups, uh, you know, any kind of milkshakes and stuff like that. And then after that, the consistency will be more kind of a little bit more softer uh, food. Uh, some people can progress quickly within like two weeks. Some people will take them about uh, four weeks or so to progress back to their uh, diet. Some people can take them a little bit longer. So, but again, it's, it's a progressive diet. Everybody have a little bit tweak of how they go, but we do give them a full detail brochure of what to expect, what to do, and what basically they have to do after work. Fantastic. And as far as uh, getting, going back to work or physical activity, what do you normally recommend patients? So I, I recommend a few days off uh, just to kind of uh, recoup and recover. Uh, we usually do this procedure on uh, Thursdays, to be honest with you. So they will have a Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. And some people like Tiffany, even she beat that number and she went back to work earlier than that. Uh, so typically people will be out of the, for the TIF procedure part, uh, three days or so. 
Uh, some people will take the whole week off just to make sure they are doing fine, especially with diet progression. Uh, but that's typically what it is. It's not like you are out of work for weeks or months or anything like that. And does that even consider hiatal hernia repair as well? So a uh, great example, Tiffany here, she had the hiatal hernia repair. So most of our patient actually, uh, we, we talk to them about a few days out of work. And that's basically what they do. Most of them, uh, or I will say a lot of them, uh, they went back to work pretty quickly. Fantastic. Thank you. And Tiffany, tell us your story. What was it like? Tell us the truth. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> um, so the recovery, like I said before, I feel it went great. Like I said, I was back to work in a couple days. Um, you know, tired. The diet is a struggle especially the first couple days because you're transitioning from actually eating solid foods to to not and just having to to make yourself full on those liquids um that was a struggle i had to remind myself to drink um i found after i don't know if it was because i just wasn't eating and that was like my food um it took me i was on liquids for about four to five days where i started to introduce some soups the jellos the puddings um things like that uh i did that for two weeks now there was at the beginning when i was transitioning into the full liquid i would have days where it just wouldn't go well so i backed off I went back into the to the liquids, gave it a day, and tried again. You know, you just got to go really, really slow when you're introducing the new foods. Um, getting into the soft foods, again, you, it's the same thing. Like Dr. Keeter said, everybody's a little different. Um, what took me five days could take somebody two days or it could take somebody two weeks. You really got to listen to your body with that. Even today, being six months out, I have to listen to my body. Yeah, I often hear that from patients yeah. saying that uh, the whole mechanism of eating is different from when it used to be. You have to teach yourself to eat slower, which is probably what everybody should be doing, right? Eat slower. Exactly. I tell people, especially if they have the hiatal hernia repair, it's uh, I tell them, you use all your life to have a highway between your esophagus and your stomach. Now that highway went back to an avenue or a street was supposed to be. So your body change. So you got to make sure you train your body of how, you know, the usual or typical eating happens. Okay, Dr. Keter, that's so. my favorite analogy so far. You I've win. Doing, <laughs> uh, you win. I've been doing TIFF talks for, you know, what, almost two <laughs> years now, and no one has explained it like that, but it makes perfect sense. So that was, that was fantastic. Uh, I, yeah. I will come into work and I'll be like, oh, you know, I tried that hot dog. It looked so good <laughs> and it didn't go down so well. <laughs> and that's what he says. Remember, it used to be a highway. <laughs> they can't take it I anymore. Love that. I love it. Well, we did get a question from uh, someone on another uh, group, Facebook group, the TIF procedure for acid reflux. So I wanted to make sure that we got his question is uh, in. Sorry. His name is Richard. And he said, I'm having a hydro hernia repair at the same time. He's having it, his um, TIF procedure on September 23rd, he said his hydro hernia is around three centimeters, been having Centimeter. reflux for 20 years now, H2 blockers and PPIs started giving me side effects. Um, I know for the first two weeks, all liquids, then kind of pureed foods. I just wanted to review my food options for that current week. So um, to your point, Dr. Keeter, you have, I believe, endogastric solutions um, pamphlet. Yeah which we can we yep. can try and post up on here um, if we can. I'm looking at my producer, Christian, that maybe we can find it and post it in there. If not, um, we will try to post it onto our GERD help page so um, all of you can see that. But Tiffany, kind of he's looking after two weeks, what you had mentioned, what were the first things that you were starting to introduce after two weeks liquids? After two weeks liquids, I started to introduce um, oatmeals, 
oh. the soups. I did tuna um, because I felt like that was a softer, um, which which went. I think I lived off of tuna for about a month because before I went into eating meats. Um, scrambled eggs. I so soft scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs. Yep, yep. Scrambled eggs for sure. I kept it pretty basic because I found that I, I'm a little bit of a picky eater, okay. I think. <laughs> and I also recommend, um, you know, you can always Google for recipes of different things that you can make your puree chop um, in your blender. And if you just went into the search bar and put like um, full liquid diet, soft diet, that will definitely give you some great ideas of things to great do. Great idea, thank you great for idea. sharing. Yeah, and I always tell people like when I give them the pamphlet and you know, there is a great suggestion on the pamphlet of what the full liquid, what the clear liquid. And I say, this is not only the only liquid or the only food you're going to eat. This is just an example. Anything with the same consistency will be okay. So uh, this is just kind of example of what's the full liquid, what's the clear liquid is. But anything with the same thing can be absolutely interesting. Very good point, Dr. Keeter. Uh, uh, can so, I interrupt yeah, too? I'm wondering, since, since Tiffany, we were talking earlier before we jumped on and you were talking about your family. How did they help you during your recovery? Did you have some of the kids making you scrambled eggs? How I, I'm thinking of a lot of parents out there who say, you know, I'd really love to do this, but I just don't know that I can manage this with my family. How did you do it? Well, my kids are great. I, I definitely talked them up before the surgery and let them know that I was going to need help. And this is what I was looking at. You know, I would be drinking and Probably I wasn't going to be eating the same meals as them. Um, they they helped. They made sure I had things in the cabinet to eat. Um, they also, you know, it, it's a struggle to go from eating solid foods to, you know, all of a sudden you can't. You know, and you just want that little, I had them on me. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> they were really good at reminding me of, uh, of my eating I habit. That. I love that. That's true. Right. That sensation of chewing something. <laughs> it, it's, yes. <laughs> um, I can't see yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, as I said before, I always uh, kind of upfront with the patient about the diet afterward, but think about it. It's a struggle for, uh, you know, a few weeks, uh, but it's kind of, you know, cure you from a problem you had for like 20 years. And then you're not going to think about uh, dealing with, you know, acid reflux or medication or side effect of the medication for the rest of your life. So it's a struggle. Uh, absolutely. Some people find it hard. Some people find it easy. Uh, but, you know, you got to look at the outcome. Absolutely. Well, I love that so. perspective because to your point, right, you've been struggling for the last 20 years taking PPIs and, and whatnot and not being able to sleep. And it's just a couple, a small window that you have to get by. Exactly. Can you maybe, Dr. Keeter, explain, you know, why that's so important to follow the diet and the rules? Um, I know you said, I love the analogy of the highway and, and um, the avenue, but, you know, can you talk a little bit about how that rebuilding and, and that you need to take the time to let your body heal? Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So as I said, people will will have the anatomy that they had for a long period of time. So the body, uh, even your subconscious and your brain, they're going to used to have this valve, which is supposed to be at the end of the esophagus. So the body is not used to have this and they think it's kind of something wrong with it. And that's when people start having those symptoms. But actually it's fixing a problem that was there for a long period of time. So the valve is basically what we call it the flappy valve. It's not kind of a sticky rock thing is going to stay there. And basically we call it a flappy because depending on the stomach movement, the food movement, it's close up. So when the food or the content of the stomach trying to get up to the esophagus, that's when the valves kind of close. Now, as I mentioned before, the recovery is different because think about it, when you have any scratch or wound or anything like that, some people, the wound will heal up right away. Others will take them a couple of weeks. So that's basically what the recovery time is different and fluctuate between patients. Love that. Thank you. I did see, and I don't know, Wendy, if you saw this or not, but there is one one question that 
that just popped up. Uh, does this procedure have any side effects in in for future in the future? And and also, if we could couple that too, there was one at the beginning of the broadcast, and I wanted to get to kind of the right place. Can you can you talk about side effects for TIF versus other therapies, and then also the safety? Because that was one of the questions at the very beginning: was is the procedure safe? Yeah, the procedure is safe. The profile of the side effect is very, very low, less than maybe one percent. And obviously, one one of the uh, side effects of the compilation called happen is what we call a perforation or injury of the esophagus lining when passing the device. Obviously, as I said before, the the TIF procedure is not for every patient. So there is some contraindication, meaning a patient that we cannot do the TIF on. Uh, examples of those uh, contraindication, if people have any uh, spine, specifically a neck surgery, if they have any kind of uh, screws or metal in their neck that fixing or kind of limiting the ability of them to move their neck, those people should not have a TIF procedure because the device will not pass through. Other thing, people, if they have issue with their esophagus before, like significant narrowing, uh, if they have what we call a barices or uh, those enlarged vein in the esophagus. So there is some contraindication. Obviously, that's part of taking the history, doing the exam. Uh, basically, that's how we get them through that evaluation to make sure we're picking the right patient for the right procedure. Now, the back to Andrea question, long-term side effect. There is really not a long-term side effect. One thing we, uh, you know, the data about the TIF, the TIF, again, it's not yesterday procedure that we are doing today. It's been out for over 10 years. There is a multiple study done on it, including what we call a sham study, meaning they brought in a patient, they randomized them into a group where patient have a procedure done, the other patient has no procedure done. Nobody knows who had the procedure or not, and they found a significant improvement in the people who have the TIF procedure. So the data out there, it's been a long, uh, we introduced it here at Maine General recently, but it's been out for a long period of time. One thing I can tell about long term, which can happen five or more years, people, the wrap or the valve that we created can get loose. And that's where the advantage in the TIF, that it's reproducible. Meaning after five years or six years from now, if they start having reflux symptoms again. They went back on antiacids years after the procedure. We can always bring them down, minimum invasive, go down with the camera again, and we create the valve again. Uh, comparing that to surgery, when they have a surgical fundoplication, the redo for the surgical fundoplication increase the risk of complication. So risk of complication for fundoplica surgical fundoplication, it's about, you know, one to five percent if they do it for the first time but if they do a redo that risk of complication with the surgery will quadruple if not five fold higher than that so that's where kind of the advantage come in with the TIF procedure fantastic thank you for sharing that wendy were there any other questions that uh came up or popped up i think we've touched on most of them you have so many thank yous for this valuable information um and and the, the time that you're spending with everybody to uh, to do the interview. So I, I just want to say that uh, you're obviously well loved by your patients. Um, I, I guess the the one question that I have that we talk about uh, that we talked about a little bit beforehand too was you know now it how are your patients doing your TIF patients and and what are you thinking you know as as far as you know, how they look right now versus what the the future of the practice looks like. The future of the practice. So, uh, you know, knock on wood, everybody been doing great. Actually, part of my program when we started this as, as a group, again, shout out to my colleague, Dr. Joseph Charpentier and Dr. Fadi Aslo. We work as a group uh, with, with the TIF program, so everybody kind of involved. And uh, we do actually collect data, uh, quality data about how we're doing. So we do give the patients what we call uh, quality of life, uh, the specific questionnaire for acid reflux. They can fill it before they undergo, during the evaluation, before they undergo the procedure. And also we collect this information afterward to make sure we are doing a good quality job. And patient will come back and follow up with us, uh, you know, a few weeks after the procedure, then six months to make sure they continue to do well. 
uh, make sure they, uh, you know, wind off their PPI. This is one thing I just want to mention. Maybe you did not mention. Oh, people will. I usually keep people on PPI after the procedure for a short period of time, and then we wean off PPI gradually. We do not just, hey, have a tiff. Don't take PPI next day. We usually wean it off. The reason is, if we, especially people on PPI for a long period of time, if you shut down the PPI suddenly, the stomach will produce a lot of acids, and that's not going to be comfortable for the patient. So we, we kind of monitor our patient, follow them. We just don't do the TIF and, hey, go back to your primary care doctor. But so far, everybody been doing great, and uh, we're having a very great result, and we increasing the amount of cases that we're doing every month. Fantastic. Now, we need to ask Tiffany, what what does it feel like to not have reflux anymore um, after the TIF procedure? You're six months out. Tell us, tell us how you're feeling. I am feeling great. I have no more bloating. I am off medication. I can eat. Um, I'm on a regular diet. I am um, cautious at what I'm eating. This has definitely shown me um, and taught me um, the foods, the good foods versus the bad foods and how I was eating. Um, I can't explain. I, I mean, I just can't believe how well I am feeling. That is so much better. So much that is better. Fantastic. That is, that I think, is the best yeah, one of the one of the super powerful things that you said earlier was you just uh, that you didn't realize how you were feeling versus how you're feeling now. Can you elaborate a little? Yes. I, I didn't realize how bad I actually was feeling and how bad the acid reflux was. I just, you know, just, okay, that's what I've got is acid reflux. Watch what you eat, um, things like that. But, I mean, this was such a turning point for me. It really was, and, and I'm glad I did it. Very glad I made that. Step. Wonderful, Tiffany. I, I think uh, we'd like to follow you, you know, a year out and maybe two years out and see um, how you're doing even, you know, far farther out. But so happy for you and so glad um, that you were able to get the procedure and find relief. Um, so before we conclude the interview, I do want to give Dr. Keeter and also you, uh, Tiffany, an opportunity, you know, if you took just let in anyone know that is suffering from uh, GERD or acid reflux out there, you know, what would your uh, recommendation or advice be to them? I'll let you go first, Dr. Keeter. So obviously uh, seek medical attention. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, acid reflux, as I said before in the beginning, is very common problem. There is a therapy available for it. Don't ignore your symptoms. Uh, as I said before, the goal as a gastroenterologist, uh, is to prevent the long-term consequences that can happen from GERD, which is unfortunately is uh, you know esophageal cancer. I'm not trying to scare people out, but it's 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 a preventable problem. Uh, seek medical attention. Uh, we are here available. Uh, you know, usually primary care. And shout out to all the primary care. They are the front line who see a lot of those reflux patients, and uh, we're always happy to if they have any question, like if. This patient appropriate for a TIF or appropriate for intervention, always happy to answer them. And shout out to my uh, full endoscopy team, including Tiffany, as well as uh, my office staff, because uh, without them, actually, the program will not be as successful as it is. So shout out to all of them. And as well as your Thanks. company, you guys been a great support with uh, all uh, the stuff that we've been doing Fantastic. here. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Keeter. And Tiffany, any any last words or words of advice for all those that are out there suffering from GERD? Yes, make the step. Go go see a, your GI doc and, um, you know, start the process. It's really worth it. Like I said, I didn't realize how bad it was until how good it is. That's fantastic. Um, I love that. That's yeah. the best statement right there. I didn't realize how bad it was until how, how good it is. Uh, I feel like you both are talking to me directly, but I'll just <laughs> go do it. Think about it. I know, I know, I know. So again, we can't thank you both enough for joining us. Um, this is really what we're here to do is educate people that are out there suffering from GERD and, and getting an expertise um, perspective from you, Dr. Keeter, and then Tiffany from you. 
um, in all the ways, right? You're a patient, you're Dr. Keeter's nurse, you 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 help do the tip procedures with Dr. Keeter right there in the endoscopy suite. So um, we can't thank you both enough and thank everybody that's watching and your fan club that's watching. Thank you for, um, for being here tonight. If you guys uh, are in the main area, you can go and find Dr. Keeter and see Tiffany as well. Um, but if you're not, I did see some questions about how do I find a physician near me? We do have a physician locator on girdhelp.com. If you just jump on there, you can, um, there's a physician finder, put in your zip code or state and you'll be able to find a TIF trained physician near you. Uh, we also do have a mobile app that could help you. It has tons of videos, content, um, information, articles about not just the TIF procedure, but also um, GERD in particular and the different diagnostic test testing that you might go through. So um, feel free to download that app. It is free um, and you can even track your symptoms um, on there as well. To bring to your doctor. So um, with that all said, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Keeter. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. And everybody joining us, thank you so much and catch us every Tuesday for our TIFF Talks. Um, have a great evening and we will see you next time. <laughs>